Um, so what I want to do this morning is I want to just kind of cast some vision for this year. Um, there's some things that are new that's going to be happening in our church. Um, and our leadership team here is very excited about this year, um, about what God's been doing leading into this year. And of course, that's not void of any complications or anything like that, because what would church be without complications, right? Um, I'm here, so right there is an opportunity for complication, right? How many would say amen to that? Amen. Too many of you. Too many of you. Um, and then, of course, Jordan's here, so, I mean, if Jordan's here, I mean, and if you haven't gathered, if you've been here very long, um, we're a church that will challenge with the word, um, because I, we just kind of basically think that we should be growing and we should be looking like Jesus, and that's a pretty tall order, uh, but it's not one that we can't grow in. Can I hear an amen? It's not one that we can't have victory in. It, it's not one that we can, can hear a message on Sunday morning and receive it and go, I need some improvement in that area. That's a good thing, that we can see it, acknowledge it to ourselves and maybe to our spouse or whoever it may be, and then commit to the Lord about growing in that area. Uh, because God wants all of us. And how many of you know that it's hard to give all of us up? Um, depending on what your upbringing has been, depending on uh, things that have happened to you. There are just some things that get down in us that are strongholds, like Sean was saying earlier, uh, closing out worship, that are hard for us to let go. Um, and yet God died for all of that. God died for the hurts, the pains, the anguish, and all of those things. So I'm going to um, actually call Darren up right now. He's going to give us an update on our remodel and the reason he's doing that is because he's the elder over all that, and I get to step out of the way and just let him talk. All right, so this room right here, there's two rooms in there. This is a storage room, and we have our kitchen right here. What we're going to do is remove the wall between those, make that one large kitchen, put in an industrial stove. We want to make it a full-functioning kitchen. So we need storage still. So on the other side of the kitchen here, there's an open area between, because actually these are two buildings that we have here. There's an open area. What we're going to do is enclose that, make it storage. So this hallway, you see how large that opening is right there? We want to make that opening go all the way to the other building. So when we walk up there, we don't, oh, hi, how are you doing? You know, wait for people to go by as we go through there. So we'll make that more functional. Where that's at is I, we have the drawings that have been done. We've submitted them to an engineer. He gave me the notes back. We've updated those drawings. I was looking at them last night, finalizing it, and I thought, gee, something's not right with the roof. So after the service, I'm going to take a ladder, and I'm going to look at something, put it in the drawings, and I'm going to submit it to the county. And then we need, a, we need somebody to actually do the work. That's our next step. Um, have you look, uh, Somebody was asking, Aaliyah, asking. So we, we're asking for uh, contractors. If they're not too busy, which... All of them are busy right now. So that's where we're at. We're going to submit to the county, and we need somebody to actually do the work to hire them, uh, contractors. That's it. Amen. I don't want to do the work. Okay. So something new that's happening this year that we have never had happen here before, and it's something that we've had to pray about, is we are taking our first mission trip down to El Salvador. Everybody say El Salvador. Um, and right now we have three people that are going. Three people. If you're one, raise your hand. Yeah, there's two back there. So we have three right now. Um, and can I just say this? If you're interested in going on that trip, we're going to be building a house is the plan. Um, it's not too late. Tickets haven't been bought yet. And so um, if you guys don't go, then it, the three of them are going to have to be the one to build the whole house, um, foundation and all. They could probably use some extra hands. Um, but we're excited about that. It's, it's been my heart um, here to have mission trips and stuff like that. And, and, uh, but how many of you know, as a pastor, I'm not called to lead everything. I'm not called to do everything. Um, and sometimes there's just time as a pastor in a smaller church that, well, Lord, this is something we'll have to put on the back burner until you provide somebody to take up the charge. And how I many you know who Meredith is? Meredith, yes. Meredith has come along. The Navy sub brought her here, and she has a heart for missions and stuff like that. And so that's awesome. But not only does she have a heart for missions that way, but she also has a heart to do things in our community. 
And so this, this year we're, we're planning to do some outreach. Um, we're still looking about what, what we can and what we can't do. Um, and I just put it out to all of you right here today. If you have ideas of what we can do in our own communi- community for outreach, would you come talk to me or go talk to, to Meredith because she'll end up coming and talking to me anyway. So, um, but we're excited about that because how many of you know when you're part of a church in a community, you should be in the community, not just here on Sunday morning. Um, and so how many of you know that to do those projects, it takes manpower, it takes energy, it takes effort. But as we do that, we get to show the love of God, as Jordan talked about this morning and last week. We get to be Christ on the projects that we'll do. So I'm excited about that. If you're interested, most Saturdays, Craig is going out once a month. Once a month, Craig is going out downtown Bremerton. Uh, for the feed. Every, every month, weather permitted. Okay, so if you want to go out on Saturday and, and do some ministry downtown Bremerton, um, Craig's been doing that for some time and having great responses, um, and then they feed once a month. Um, that's something that we're currently doing, and Craig would love to have uh, some more people with him um, and stuff. And if, how many of you remember Ellie? Yeah. Ellie goes with him sometimes, too. Um, so Ellie's still the same. <laughs> That's Ellie. Yeah, you all laugh because you know Ellie. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, there's a thing up on the wall next to the information table. It's called Surge. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Surge, but Surge is an incredible church planting initiative that was started by Larry Stockstill back in uh, 2000. Um, I had the privilege a week and a half ago of being down in Portland listening to Larry cast vision for the importance of planting churches in the world, not only in the world, but also in America. Um, And it was really awesome because he's involved in every aspect of the world, planting churches. And so he has his hand on many things that we probably wouldn't hear. And so he began to just share testimony after testimony of what God's doing throughout the world. Indonesia is having an incredible revival and awakening, which happens to be the highest Muslim country in the world, populated Muslim country in the world, and people are turning to Christ in the droves. Um, they, uh, uh, how many of you guys remember when, when uh, the uh, Coptic Christians in Egypt were beheaded on the shoreline? So he gave some history on that, and at that time, Uh, Egypt had one million Christians in it. Since that time, they now have four million Christians in it. So, and and then if, obviously, we're heavily involved in Christ for India, or India, um, there's persecution that's starting to rise up there because the Hindu uh, prime minister there is a militant Hindu and wants to get every religion out of India, and he wants a 100% Hindu nation. And so right now, talking with Abraham last week, um, they're not feeling any pressure right now, but those that are feeling the pressure are other religions uh, in that nation. And so be mindful to keep kind of praying and lifting up India, because it is real, it is happening, um, and uh, Christ for India is a very large organization over there with 4,500 churches, schools, um, Bible colleges, engineering school, and a lot of other things that are going on. Um, so they have a, f- a foothold in there, um, but it is serious. So we want to continue to just keep planting churches as a church so far since I think 2015, 2014, we've planted 16 churches. Yeah. Um, come on. And then you had to go plant it. And then you had to go plant it. <laughs> So most of these are in Africa. We just did two this year in Central America. Um, And so uh, pretty exciting to me because as he gave updates on as a whole at Christ for any, or not Christ, Surge, they have planted over 20,000 churches through Surge. 20,000 churches all over the place. Nations that are against Christianity in general. China, Middle East, they planted everywhere. And here's the cool thing. So the the estimate is 20,000 to 24,000. And that's because churches get planted. And some of those churches that get planted, that pastor plants more churches. 
And so what will happen typically is if they're in like a village in Africa, if they have a motorcycle or some form of transportation, they can actually use their motorcycle and give rides to people from one place to the next place, charge them a fare to help raise money for them. Uh, come on. Um, and then go, because they'll just go down the road and just start planting churches into the next village, into the next village, into the next village. And so you never know. You might plant a church, and next thing you know, that guy planted 100 churches um, around. And so that's pretty awesome, and we have a heart for that. Power went out. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we really want to do is we want to focus on getting people plugged into Alive Groups. Can I hear a shout out for Alive Groups? Yeah. Um, and let me just explain this from my heart. Alive Groups are critically important because Alive Group is where you're going to have ministry. Alive Group is where you're going to have fellowship and friendship and you're going to build relationship with one another. Now, obviously, we don't want all of those to become little cliques and we stay on Sunday morning or when we have corporate gatherings in our little cliques and stuff like that. Um, we really want to have a heart of unity that wants to get to know everybody. Come on. Yeah. Not just the pastor, not just Jordan, not just other people, but you want to get to know everybody because everybody is a peculiar person. Man. How many of you are peculiar people? Yeah. I'm going to put my hand down because I don't think I am, even though my wife does. <clears throat> So we, we, we want to do that. We want to funnel people into small groups and, and, and stuff, and we have some stuff happening in September as we, we launch them for that in, end of the year um, that we're pretty excited about. Um, and then I just want to draw your attention to the, the last whatever weeks it's been. I've been talking about pray, share Jesus, grow. I don't need to do repeat because that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Go back, pray, share Jesus, grow. Go back, pray, share Jesus, grow. Grow, share Jesus, pray. You know, just keep doing it all. Um, but my heart is, when it comes to prayer, we need to pray more. Can never pray less. We need to pray more. And I'll just share something I shared with the, 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 prayer, the church prayer group on um, that I'd like you guys to pray for. I'm going to start endeavoring to try to get pastors in Kitsap County together to pray. And if you've been in this county for a long time, you know it's next to impossible to get pastors together in this county. Um, but now's the time to do it. Pastors have got to unite. Put aside your differences. I don't care if you don't speak in tongues. I don't care. Um, I don't care. If we can come together and go, we love Jesus and we're here to build G the kingdom of God, we have unity right there. We can let all the other stuff go by the wayside because that's not what that meeting is about. The meeting is simply about coming together and praying for our county and praying for our churches and praying that God would begin to move because if you don't know this, Kitsap County is a dark place. Come on. I remember flying down to New Orleans a few years back and I felt flying in there the darkness of New Orleans. People feel the darkness of Kitsap County. And it's not maybe the same as New Orleans, but it is an isolation-type county where people come and isolate themselves from other people. We can go out there in Seabeck and have our five acres of land and not be bothered. We have people that work in Seattle, come home and hunker down and don't, don't leave, and they, their whole life is going to Seattle, coming back. They don't want relationship. So in and of itself, that creates a dark, dark area because people don't want to be in relationship. But how many of you know we need relationship? God didn't create us to be islands unto, unto ourselves. He didn't create the church to be an island unto itself. He created us all to be in relationship, no matter how hard they are. Come on. No matter how hard relationships are, God has created us to be in them because it helps us grow, helps us learn how to love. Okay. Then we obviously want to share Jesus. I didn't hear one amen there. We want to grow in this area of sharing Jesus because, as I said in those series of messages, that's what we're here for. Can I be so bold today and say this? We're not here to just do the normal American lifestyle, going to work, spending money, going home, eating it, doing whatever we're doing, watching TV, whatever. We are actually here to build his kingdom. We're here to build his kingdom. And that was the mandate that, he, that Jesus gave between the time of his raising from the dead before he ascended into heaven before the day of Pentecost. We're here to build his church. 
And I'll take Jordan's word this morning. You heard it now. Can't take it back. You're obligated. Now, when I say that, you could sit there and get all freaked out right now, right? Oh, I'm not sitting here telling you you got to stand up on your cafeteria table at school or at, the, at your work in your cubicles at your workplace or wherever you work to stand up there and start yelling and screaming, veins popping out of your neck, telling them to turn their lives to Jesus. I'd actually just tell you, get to know them first. Open up a door to actually speak into their life. There's many forms of evangelizing. There's many, and that, that word's a dirty word. There's many ways of sharing Jesus. We should figure out what they are and get engaged in at least one of them and begin to be part of what God's doing. Because God desires to see all men and women and children saved. Amen. So we got to give them an opportunity. Can I hear an amen? amen? And of course, we want to grow, which was a three-part series just within the series itself that we're called to grow. And, and it kind of led really easy into unity. And, and unity is an area that we need to grow in. And, and how, many, how many understand that God wants you to grow. He's not going, man, I wish they would grow. What can we do, Jesus, to help them grow? I don't know, Dad. Um, we gave them the Word. We gave them the Spirit. Yeah, I think they've got everything they need to grow, except surrender, maybe. So if we come to a place of surrendering to God's leading, God's Spirit that, that's in us to change us and His Word, uh, we can't help but grow. And, get, and I'm going to say it, we need to grow. We need to be different than what we were when we got saved. Um, and then I want to um, kind of land this morning just talking about our current situation um, in the world, and that's the coronavirus. Um, I want to kind of address that today. Um, because one of the things that I, and I am kind of staying up on it a little bit, um, and it's hard because there's so much conflicting information out there, uh, but I, I feel like I got a fairly decent handle on it. Um, but one thing that I can say in all honesty and integrity, that since this has made news, there's a lot of fear and anxiety that has risen up in America and in the world. Um, so how, how we proceed with such stuff that's going on in our nation or in, in our world? Um, how do we move forward? You see people panicking and and people going out and they're buying up all these medical supply stuff at the expense of medical supplies for the medical people. <laughs> um, how many of you guys tried to get uh, water at Costco last weekend? Last weekend, it was insane. I happened to be in Costco. It was insane. I'm in Silverdale, parked out literally to Lowe's because there's no parking spots. Got in there. They are already out of toilet paper. They're out of water last week. They got water back. I was there yesterday. They got water back. Um, Ran into Janique and Mark at, at uh, Costco yesterday. Still don't have toilet paper. Um, and so there's this mass panic. But I think the church actually has an opportunity to lead. I think we actually have an opportunity in our workplace to lead. To not live in the fear and the anxiety that comes from it. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down. I'm going to make it real simple this morning. Um, but I think we have a great opportunity. This is not the time for the church to be fearful. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there, there shouldn't be anybody in here that's fearful about. We all have things that we're fearful of. Okay, I don't know about you, but have you ever been on the side of a cliff in Hawaii, driving a car, where there's no room to go to two cars, and over the edge? How far do you think that was down on the back? Yeah, she doesn't like, she doesn't like that. Darren, you remember that? Going around that backside, about how much? A couple hundred feet down to rocks below. That's a little scary. My wife, she doesn't let, you know, on a bus going out to the blowhole in, in Mexico, freaking out because we're on the edge of cliffs and she's on that side. She, okay, silently, even though I had marks still in my arm from her, <laughs> from her you know, permanent scars, but... But we all have different fears in that kind of stuff. And, and as Christians, it's, let's, let's say it this way. As Christians, we shouldn't fear everything, but we should be un understanding why we're fearing. Listen, David, if you read through the Psalms, David at times was depressed at what was going on in his, in his life. 
There are times that David feared and understands something. Saul was seeking to kill him. I guess if you had a hit on your life, you might be fearful too. I probably would be as well. But then again, I can kind of could go, hmm, last breath here, first breath in heaven. Huh, hmm, wait, too much to do yet, too soon to go. But, yeah, you know, but hey, on that note, this is not our home. Heaven is our home. And the worst case scenario in, in, in the world is if we were to die as a believer, gosh, we're going to be in heaven. It doesn't get any better than that. And I'm not saying that to fear anybody right now, okay? But we do have this, 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 this growing anxiety that's, that's rising up um, in, in the world today. And I just want to say this. As, as believers, I believe that it's a trap of the enemy. The enemy will use anything in the culture to get us to fear. And it's our choice whether we're going to step into that or it's our choice to fight it. It's our choice to to let it take over us, or it's our choice to combat it. Um, where there is fear, the enemy torments us. Why? Because we give him opportunity. You, you, when you start fearing, you give the enemy entrance into your mind to start tormenting you. Right. And I'll tell you what, if you're fearful of one thing, all of a sudden you're going to start being fearful of a lot of other things. Yeah. And what happens when you have fear in your life? You lose joy and you lose, lose peace. Why? Because wherever there's a loss of joy and peace, there's a loss of faith, and there's a loss of trust in who God is and who God declares himself to be. Now, I would not recommend anybody right now running around with your tongue licking every, every ha uh, handle to any, any uh, public square. I, wouldn't, I would not advise you to do that. I would call that stupid because you're probably going to pick up other things other than a virus. <laughs> But nonetheless, there's wisdom, church, there's wisdom in what we're dealing with today. And so how can we as a church practically deal with this scenario that's happening in America? So I'm going to start first by just giving us some practical guidelines that you, would, you can find from the CBC, uh, C, C, DC. Um, and it's this. I started doing this yesterday in Costco. I think you guys were the first one that got it. Don't handshake. They actually recommend you elbow. Give me a sample. Come on. Here, let's do a sample of an elbow greeting. Yeah, buddy. Why? Try to lick your elbow afterwards, okay? Um, or a fist bump. If you notice me greeting out there, sometimes I'll give you a fist bump. They actually recommend when it comes to turning on light, light switches that you don't use your fingers. You use your elbow. If you're really good, your hip. Um, but they recommend you use your knuckle. So light switches, elevator buttons, anything that people would touch with their hands, you just think about doing it a different way. I would challenge you if you're in an elevator once in a while, maybe you just go and hip chuck all the little, all the little things and see if you get it right. And maybe by the end you can get it dialed in to get in the right one, you know? They actually recommend that you open doors with your closed fist or hip, so like crash bars. Maybe for some of you shorter people, you might have to jump and then throw a hip in it. I think I just pulled something. Um, but that's beside the point. We'll get through it. Um, they actually recommend that you don't grab things with the handle. They, they actually recommend that if you can, which is now hard to do, is to find a, uh, an antibacterial uh, sanitizer. Walmart, anything that was there is no longer there. I had heard, don't know if this is true, that China pulled back all of their, all of the stuff that was headed to America. They pulled it back for their own nation. Um, and so, uh, and they actually, you know, things that you don't think about, like pumping gas, you gotta, gotta, can't quite hip check the gas thing, nozzle into your thing. So you actually have to grab that with your, your hand. There's things that we do by habit that we don't understand. We just put germs on 
our on our on our hands. And then if you're picking your ear or your nose or you know got some sugar or something on your fingertips and you put it in your mouth, not thinking about it, bam. Okay. And so even that they recommend. Think about it. Get some little hand sanitizer to sanitize your hands while you're after you do some of this stuff. They actually recommend you have some maybe hand sanitizer in your house. Um, I, I think I dug up and I hope it's still good about 20 year old hand sanitizer out of my glove compartment in my car. I'm trusting it's still working. We'll find out. <laughs> And they actually recommend that you wash your hands for 10 to 20 seconds. Um, if you don't know this virus in itself, and by the way, flu virus in general, all these apply, which I don't know if you know this, but we've had way more deaths in America, just the normal flus than we've had from anything that coronavirus has done. So even that getting blown up is just another way that the enemy uses things to uh, create fear. Uh, they actually also recommend if you're going to sneeze or cough to not do this. <coughs> oh. uh, they actually recommend you do it in your elbow. Do it in your elbow! I'm like going, what? Nobody's around. Yeah, but you just sprayed it everywhere. Because that is a reality. You spray it everywhere. Um, and uh, and even though you might not catch it airborne, whatever it lands on, it lands on. Okay, we're just being practical and honest today, okay? Um, so, now, now get this. You sneeze in your elbow, wash your shirt. Because it can survive up to a week there. So how many people grab you by the elbow? Probably some. Have a, have, have a split going on right here. <laughs> Alright, so how, how can we respond spiritually? And I'm just going to remind you, where there's fear, there's a loss of faith, trust, and peace and joy. And this is an indication that our mind needs some transformation. And again, not just virus, just anything in general where we lose faith, trust, peace, and joy, that tells us something's not right with our thinking. And can I say this? We all, in some area of our life, have stinking thinking. It's not right, but we have it. Sometimes we defend ourselves for that thinking. Sometimes we die on the hill with that way, way that we think. But if it's bringing a loss of faith and trust in who God is, if it's bringing a loss of, of joy and peace, it's not right. Thank you. The only way to overcome negative thinking or wrong thinking is to change it. Come on. It's, it's to change it. Romans 8, 6 says this, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. How many want life and peace? And we got to get our stinking thinking out. we got to get man's way of thinking out and let the Spirit, who we have, begin to uh, reveal to us things that need to change in our thinking. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says this, For, th for through we... For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is so critically important, church. Can I ask you this? How many of you would say that you do a good job checking your thoughts? hands go up. All right. Talking to the right group today. That we control what comes through our mind. Because we'll say this another hundred thousand times. The enemy is going after your mind because it's the mind he attacks. And he attacks it with lies because he's the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar today. And he's a liar all along. He wants you to believe a lie. So I want to encourage us today that we have a God in heaven that is our protector. I want to encourage you today that we have a God in heaven that didn't send his son to the cross to die to defeat sin and death, but just not just that, but he sent us so we could have life to his fullest. I want to encourage you today that we have a God in heaven that through his son Jesus Christ, we have life and have it more abundantly. 
can I say this as well? We have a God in heaven who sent his son to the earth to die for us in our place. Not only did he just set us free to take care of our fears and our doubts and our anxiety, but he died that even though we're in a fallen world, he can protect us. to believe 